In this 19th podcast, we still continue our look at forces, but we look at vectors uh, in more detail and Newton's first law. So on Earth, we can't escape the effect of forces, and this motorbike example can show us some of those things. Firstly, of course, we have weight, the force of gravity pulling us down onto the Earth. As a result of that force, the ground pushes back on us as well, in this case with an equal and opposite force, and we call that the reaction force. Also in this situation, the motorbike is riding forwards, so there must be a push force from the engine propelling the bike forwards. But if the motorbike is going uh, through the air and on the ground, there must also be a friction force. So in this simple example, there are at least four forces on the motorbike. Weight downwards, reaction force upwards, push force propelling the motorbike forwards, and friction force trying to slow the motorbike down. So I've used arrows to represent the forces on the motorbike, and these arrows are termed vectors. And they're just arrows that represent the forces. They show us two things. They show us the size of the force. So we've got a big force here, small force here, medium force here, and the direction of the force, up, down, diagonally left, and diagonally right. And if these were drawn to scale, then the scale would actually tell us how big the forces were uh, in newtons. So in physics, we call these diagrams with force vectors upon them, free body diagrams. And they help us to understand the total or resultant force on an object. So these pictures here, um, one of a, a blimp or an airship, and this one of the motorbike again, uh, with the force arrows drawn on them, are free body diagrams. So let's have a look at the forces acting firstly on this blimp. So it's floating in the air. So we must have a buoyancy force. Now, that is a force pushing it upwards. So I'll put that arrow in there. It's an object in gravitational field, so it must have a weight. Now, the weight must be less than the buoyancy, otherwise the thing's not going to float. But in this case, you can see it's tethered to the ground, so there must be two other forces, one in each rope holding it to the ground, like this. Something like that. In the motorbike example, which we've seen already, gravity, the reaction force, let's flip that one round, I'm making it an equal length because the motorbike is not changing its motion in the vertical plane and we've got a push force from the engine and we've got friction force from the air and the road something like that now the resultant force is simply the arrows the vectors added together now when we add vectors together it's not simply a matter of just adding all the numbers up. We have to consider the direction of the vectors as well. Now it's reasonably straightforward if we're considering just horizontal or vertical, up and down or left and right, because we can think of uh, the directions as being positive or negative, and then we can just add them as we would in mathematics. Let's take a look at an example. So I've got my forces here. Weight, the motorbike and rider, 3,000 newtons. As a result, the reaction force from the ground, 3,000 newtons. Now, one of these we can take as positive, and one of these we can take as negative because they're in opposite directions. Positive 3,000, negative 3,000, add these together, we get zero. The push force from the engine, 800 newtons and the friction force from the ground and the air, 300 newtons. We can take one of these as positive and one as negative. Positive 800, 
negative 300. So 800 minus 300. Of course, 500. So the resultant force on the motorbike is 500 newtons to the right. Now that suggests that this motorbike is actually accelerating in this direction. It's getting faster. So let's look at another example. Here's the space shuttle, now uh, defunct. We have the thrust from the engines, a very large thrust. And of course, it's an object in the gravitational field of Earth, so we have the object's weight in the opposite direction. And we also have the drag force. Uh, we could call that uh, a friction force. So we've got thrust from the engine. We've got weight due to gravity. And we've got drag force there. Now if we put some numbers to these things, let's say the thrust is about 10,000 newtons. And let's say the weight is 3,000 newtons. And let's say the drag is 4,000 newtons. Now we can see that the thrust is in the opposite direction to the weight and the drag. Let's call the thrust positive, And let's call the weight and the drag negative. Now we can see that the resultant force on this object is going to be 10,000 added to these ones here, and these are negative. So we have 10,000 minus 3,000 minus 4,000, which equals positive 3,000 newtons. So the resultant force is 3,000 newtons in the up direction because this force was bigger than these two forces added together. So here's another way to add force vectors, and it involves drawing. So here's the motorbike example again with the four vectors drawn on it. And uh, we can add these together by simply uh, drawing them end to end like this. So I've got the vectors here. They're the same vectors. So we've got reaction force and weight, push force from the engine, and friction force. So let's add them together by drawing. There's the reaction force. This is the push force that I need to change its direction of. Okay, that looks about right. Now the weight arrow. Let's get that one in there as well. Weight. And the friction arrow. It's just the direction of this one from left to right. It's about right. There we go. Now, this shape doesn't close, which means there is a resultant force. If this shape had closed with the final vector joining with the start of the first vector, then we know there is no resultant force. So we know there is a resultant force now, and the resultant force is simply an arrow drawn from the start of the first vector to the end of the last vector. So let me show you that. Let's get an arrow. So that is the resultant vector from this position to this position. So it's pointing in the to the right, which means the resultant force is this much force. Again, we don't have a scale, but we can see that it's to the right, which means the motorbike is uh, accelerating to the right, getting faster to the right. And we can see that really just by looking at this diagram because the up and down forces are equal in length, so they sort of cancel with each other. But this force, the blue one, is longer than this force, so this force beats this force, if you like, and the resultant force is to the right. Here's something a little bit more tricky. Now, let's take this aeroplane, for example. It's banking, which means it's turning. And if we look head-on, the aeroplane looks something like this. So what are the forces acting in the vertical plane? So 
of course, we have gravity acting down. And we have a force called lift acting up, but it's not acting directly up. It's acting in this direction, like so. So how do we work out the resultant force in this case? Well, again, we can uh, use the same sort of technique as before. And here we go. I'm just going to uh, ungroup these arrows here. And what we can do is we can, again, draw the forces end to end, and we can find the resultant force in that way. So the lift force, the blue one, I'm going to leave where that is, where it is. And I'm going to draw the weight arrow down here. And an arrow drawn from the start of the first vector to the end of the last vector is the resultant force. So let's take that one. Start of the first vector to the end of the last vector. And that is the resultant force. So we can see the resultant force is to the right. And in fact, we know it should be to the right because the aeroplane is going to bank and it's going to turn in this direction. It's going to turn to the right. So we need that resultant force to push it in that direction. So let's take a look at some of uh, at Newton's laws of motion. So he first published his three laws of motion in 1687 in uh, the Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica. And this is an actual page from the first edition and it relates it, uh, to the first law. This is actually the first law here which states that every body persists in its state of being at rest or of moving uniformly straight forwards except in so far as it is compelled to change its state by force impressed or a body at rest or in uniform motion remains in that state unless acted on by an external resultant force so what this tells us is that zero resultant force means no change in motion it also tells us if there is a resultant force, we will observe a change in motion or an acceleration. So here's an example. Here we are with weight and reaction force, drag and thrust. We can see that the car has a resultant force to the right because the vertical arrows cancel. The horizontal arrow to the right is longer than the horizontal arrow to the left. So the resultant force is to the right. This means the car will not remain at rest and will not remain in, a, in uniform motion. It will accelerate. So let's take a look at a, another example. Here we have a submarine, a beautiful yellow submarine, being propelled forwards by its engine but experiencing drag due to the water. It has a buoyancy force keeping it from uh, sinking completely and it has a weight due to gravity. Now we can see that the horizontal forces are equal in length but opposite in direction so they will cancel out. We can see the same thing is true about the vertical forces equal in length but opposite in direction. So they will cancel out. So this submarine will remain in uniform motion, which could be stationary. It could be moving uni with uniform speed to the left or to the right, and with uniform speed either up or down, but it won't be accelerating. So in summary, vectors show us the size and the direction of a force. They can be added together to give the total or the resultant force. Newton's first law tells us what will happen to an object given its resultant force. So if the resultant force is zero, the object's motion won't change. It will remain at a constant speed or not moving. Uh, and if it's not zero, it will accelerate. It will either get faster or possibly get slower.